to you this morning about the Christian family because I'm trying to talk to you about um, Christian growth and part of Christian growth is, uh, is uh, how we behave as families and, uh, and I'll probably talk about other things as well but today I want to talk to you about the Christian family and I'm, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know, but I do really think that uh, the, the family is being challenged by the world so that, uh, that I can get up here and tell you what a family is and, uh, and there's actually could be people in this congregation who want, would want to challenge me uh, I, if I wanted to say a, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Uh, there could be people in this congregation that would like to challenge me and say, no, uh, uh, marriage is, uh, 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 is two beings uh, because we're not even allowed to say they're male or female. You can choose for yourself uh, or you can choose not to have any gender whatsoever. So, so uh, th what they're doing is, you may not realise it, but the world is playing around with God's definitions. And uh, we, we, the church, we belong to God. And so we want God's definitions. And if God's definitions offend you, I can't help you. If we offend you in that way, because we, we're the family of God, we're trying to use the definitions that God uses. He's the one that made man and made woman and told them to cleave to one another. He's the one that said that. Um, and I'm, I'm not into my study yet, but, uh, but he's, he's the one that said that. So if he's the one that set it up right at the beginning, that's the way it is. And, uh, and uh, a family, if we, if the, it doesn't matter what you think a family unit is. A family unit is what God says it isn't. It's a husband and wife. And uh, if children come along, children are part of that. And God has expectations for every part of us. And, uh, and if we're part of a family, <clears throat> that doesn't mean I cannot wait to get married because I'm a man. And therefore, once I get married, uh, I am supreme because I've got a woman who I can beat and abuse and, uh, because I'm, I'm the authority, you don't understand. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about anything like that. But we all have roles to play. And if we play our roles the way God expects us to, even right down to the kids, we will have good families. And uh, you can seek your source of having good families elsewhere. You can put different, different definitions on the family from other places, but today we're in the church, so we're going to put godly definitions on these things, and we hopefully talk about godly aspects to being a, a husband, a wife, children. And I'm talking a lot, and we haven't even started, and I've got tons of pages. But I do want to tell you that I'm talking to the church. <clears throat> and I want to also tell you that we believe that Jesus died for the church. He died for all men, but he, he specifically died for the church. And therefore, as Christians, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important thing. <clears throat> of all the things we talk about, and I do feel like it's important to talk about the family, but the most important thing that we need to understand as Christians is the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ because he gave his life that all men might be set free from their sins. <coughs> and there's only one approach to God and that is through Calvary. There's no other approach. And Calvary declares, declares how much we love, that he loves us. And that's why uh, Christmas is a, another pagan festival that the church has embraced uh, but we're not particularly embracing Christmas, but we do say, you know, if you want to celebrate something at Christmas time, celebrate Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that paid the big, biggest price that we might be set free from our sins. And being set free from our sins feels good. The day I gave my heart to the Lord, things started to change in my life. <clears throat> and not everything goes perfectly after that. James, not as everything's perfect, but this is the best life. I don't want to pick up those old things I laid down. I don't want to take those things up again. And we as Christians, we actually believe there's a way of appropriating Calvary, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ to our lives. And we believe that's through repentance, a de determination in our minds that we're not going to sin anymore, that we're going to follow the ways of God. 
It's a decision we make, but it's a decision that is seen in our behavior. So that when I repent of my sins, I'm not going to do the things I used to do. But my sinful nature is still in me, so it wants to do it. But I need to yield myself to God that he can overcome the sins in my life. We don't wait until we get perfect to come to Jesus. We come to Jesus in the mess we've made of our life and say, God help. And when we do that and we say, I want to stop this. I need a change of life. God, God, that's repentance. And when we repent, Acts 2.38, if you want to put it up there, Madison, I don't know whether you, you've got all those other scriptures. But Acts 2.38, Peter was talking to them on the day of Pentecost. And they said, we've crucified the Lord of glory. What shall we do? And he said, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, to wash away your sins. So we actually believe that if we want to be in right standing with God, we need to repent of our sins. We need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And there's a purpose for it, to wash away our sins. And so the sin issue is actually dealt with. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have appropriate his name to our sins in baptism. And then when we are baptized we'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. And so we actually believe on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in languages they didn't know. People heard them speaking in languages. They actually understood some of those languages, but they couldn't understand. How come he's talking in that language? Because he doesn't know it. And yet they were speaking in languages they never knew. And, uh, and when that happened, we believe that what happened was God filled the emptiness of our hearts. And uh, we were filled with that unsatisfiable satisfaction. And he transformed us and he gave us the ability to overcome temptation. To live above sin. Not perfect. We fail him at times. But when we fail, we say, God, I'm sorry. But he's given us the want to. And he's actually given us the ability to resist temptation. And it feels good. And we need to hang on to it all our lives. We need to be a part of this all of our lives. So... Uh, the best thing, if you haven't experienced the salvation plan of Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, you, you need to start looking into it. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking to people, I'm talking to the church this morning when I'm talking about the family. I said all that to tell you this. I'm talking to the church about the family and our responsibilities. And uh, as people, there are a lot of influences uh, in our lives, peer groups, uh, business associates, our friends, our church, but there's no more, um, uh, nothing affects us more than our families. That is what causes us to be who we are. It's very, it's very sad when, when I look at my kids and, and Daniel's got some good qualities and he's got some poor qualities. And I don't want to tell you this, but some of the poor qualities I see in me. And I, when I see him doing things, I think, wow, that's just like his dad. I don't say it out loud. I usually say, it's Ellen. Mind your business. And then Fiona, well, she's just perfect. And she's just like her dad as well. And it's the influence. There's an influence that comes into our lives. And one of those strongest influences is the family. <clears throat> and so families are important. And in God's economy, families are highly important. In fact, God made the family before he made the church. And if we don't have strong families, we will not have a strong church. We, we, the church, the family, it's all tied together. But our highest priority is our families even so than the church. The church is secondary to God, to our families. He wants us to raise good families, and if we raise good families, we'll have good churches. And not only good churches, but we'll have good communities. We'll actually be part of a good nation. But while the, the nations are tampering with the family, they're, they're doing damage to our morality. They're doing damage to everything. <clears throat> so I think we better start, Madison, before you're not off. Genesis chapter 2, she's got a lot of scripture. We've got 45 minutes and I don't know how I'll get through it all. But we'll see what happens. Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. 
Lolita, would you like to read that for us, please? <coughs> This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Okay, so that's talking about husbands and wives. And I, could, I actually had a lot of scripture pertaining to families uh, and that kind of thing as well. But I, I don't have the time to read it all. But we'll start with husbands and wives. We don't want families outside of husbands and wives particularly. We, we want a husband and a wife and a family. So I've picked that um, uh, particular scripture. And uh, uh, verse 24 tells us, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Whatever that means. So the family was the first institution established in this world by God and it will only be properly maintained and kept through His wisdom and guidance. We need God in our families. If we don't put God at the centre of our lives and the centre of our families, then we're not going to have the families that God wanted. In the Garden of Eden, there, it was a love triangle. I don't want to offend you, but the Garden of Eden was a love triangle and the closer that those two got to God, the closer they would get to each other. And it's still the same in our lives. Don't be afraid of having this love of triangle with God where God is the center. If we keep the God at the center of our lives and God keep God at the center of our marriages, then it doesn't mean things won't go wrong, but we will work things out in a godly fashion and we will have strong marriage relationships which is highly important to having strong family relationships and in the family if we keep God at the center and we as a family get closer and closer to God we're going to get closer and closer to each other at the same time so uh, we, we want God in our marriages we want God in our families the funny thing is we want God in our marriages we want God in our families but we don't necessarily do anything uh, to cause that to happen but if we, if we, because if we want to cause it to happen, we're going to have to pray together. We need to read the word together. We need to make sure that we're doing things where God, God is the center. And our kids, it's not just me thinking God's the center of my life, but my, our kids need to understand <clears throat> that God is the center of their life as well, the center of our li families. And old fashioned. Morality and godly principles will only be maintained in our families if we submit our families to the Lord. It's not just going to happen automatically. We have to submit our families to God to see God moving in our families. <clears throat> it's been said, destroy the family and you will destroy the nation. Now, I don't know who said it, but it, when families aren't strong, nations go downhill. I don't want to offend Australia, but I think Australia is not where it was in the 50s. And I think part of that is because the family unit is not as strong now as it was in the 50s. Now, there's not many of you remember those days, but I'm just telling Daniel, I'm just telling you that's the way it was. And in the scripture, the Lord laid down principles of submission, leadership, Authority, responsibility in the family. He laid down those things in the family. And what we do is we think, uh, we think that we are this or we're that when God is, we, we're, I'm a male, but I have a role to play in the family. And I need to understand what my role is. And if I can understand my role, I will have a better family. Uh, Ellen's, Ellen's a woman, but she has a role in the family. And if she can understand her role in the family, then we'll have better families. And as we conform to the principles of the Word of God, 
our own personal character will grow and our family relationships will develop at the same time. I'm trying to talk to you about how to grow in your Christ, Christianity and it will come about as we uh, grow in our families. And it's important that every one of us, the youngest to the oldest, finds our place in the family. We, we need to find our place. And if, you, if, you, if you're in a broken family, you're still in the family of the church. And these things are effective. <clears throat> so, what, what is a family? That's the first question I want to ask you. What is a family? And in answering that, I've put Christ. Is that, is, when we're talking families, we're talking Christ. If I don't talk to you about Christ, I'm not being honest about what a family is because Christ is a part of the family. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, please, Madison. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. And Ephesians 4, 15 But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So these scriptures are talking about, um, uh, um, one of them is talking about the family and Christ is the head. And, uh, and in everything, the head is Christ. So the head of the family is Jesus and we are under subjection to him. That is, we're submitted, yielded to him in the family, in the family unit. We're all submitted to him. Now, it is the man's responsibility to take the headship role of his house. It's the man that is to do that. And so, um, it's when, a, when the wife is taking the leadership role in a family, that's not the way God made it. <clears throat> she may be a better administrator. She may be more organized. But in God's economy, he has said that there's a structure in the family and we need to come under his structure. It's not talking about... It, it, the, uh, uh, our family wouldn't function without Ellen. Ellen's the supervisor, the, the dictator, the, she's everything. But she actually understands the headship of Christ and the authority of the husband. And so uh, these things, we, we, we're a team. A family is not... You do this, you do that. It's a team. It works together. And husbands and wives working together is a good thing. In the ministry, well, I believe in ministry teams. I don't think I, don't think I can't be the pastor if Ellen's not with me 100%. And, uh, and so uh, we, we're in ministry, we're a team. And, and I, I, I can't understand if, um, if uh, Daniel was the, a minister and Fiona was, had, no, I just, I'm just going to look after the kids. It's not going to work. <clears throat> Hampson's a licensed minister. If Joy's not part of that, it's not going to work. And in actual fact, when we go around visiting other churches, they want to see our wives as much as they want to see us because we're a team. If I, if I actually went on presbyter duties without taking Ellen with me, I'd probably be hung before I got back home. <laughs> because, well... But they want to see the why. I don't, I, I'm like you. I'm devastated. I don't understand. But they do <laughs> because we're a team. That's how it is. Right. Ephesians 5 and 23. You can tell I'm hoping that my voice will hold out. I may, might get... Lolita to read all the scriptures and, and I'll, I'll rest at times. But I'll do this one. See, here we go. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Now, a man cannot expect to take a leadership role in the church until he learns how to rule his house well. You can't be a leader in the church if you don't know how to rule your house well. <coughs> First Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. 
For if a man know not how to rule his own house, he shall, how shall he take care of the church of God? And to be the head of the family, you will fulfill this responsibility by, a, by being a lifetime loving companion. It's not, nothing to do with, I'm, a, I'm brute male. It's nothing to do with that. But if I want to lead my family well, I will show forth the love of God to that family. They'll see it in me, the way I behave. It's not just, Daniel, I love you. He wants to experience it in, in me being the dad that I ought to be. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 9 and 9. This is a good scripture. I'll get um, Lolita to read it for us. Should be up on the screen in a minute. Just read off the screen. Ecclesiastes 9 and 9. Live joyfully with the wife of whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he has given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Okay, so he's talking about all his vanity, okay? In, in Ecclesiastes he's saying all his vanity. It's all, it's just... And what he's saying to you, to you men is the best vanity that you can hope for is loving your wife and having a wonderful wife. That's, that's the best in life. If you've got a good, good companionship in marriage, you've got everything there is that life is offering. That's really what it, He's a bit miserable. He's a bit down. But he's actually saying, you know, uh, of all the great things in this world, well, at least you've got love with your wife and... and uh, and uh, that's a good thing. Colossians chapter 3 verse 19 tells us, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And in verse 21 it tells us, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So scripture's telling us that we, we need to be loving towards our wives and we need to be actually loving towards our children. And again, men, we know how to press button. Kids know how to press the buttons of the other of, of their other siblings. But parents know how to do it, and, and husbands are very good at pressing the buttons of their kids. But it's not becoming, because when you when you push the buttons of your kids <clears throat> and they retaliate, then you get tell them off because of their behaviour. You're the one that's causing the trouble, not the child. And so you, when you do it, you are very discouraging. <clears throat> now, sorry, Daniel, but I, when I was in Adelaide, Daniel, you won't believe this, but Daniel was probably all about that big. And, uh, and we used to sit down the front, <clears throat> and Daniel was allowed to sit there nicely. But the people, the people back further, people about like where you are, He'd be here, and he might be on Ellen's, just here, and you're pulling faces at him. I know you're pulling faces at him, because he starts to giggle. And so, what you're doing is, you, know, you actually, it doesn't take you very long to understand, he's now in trouble with his dad. So, I take him out, and I smack him for not behaving in church. Because I want him to behave in church, do you remember that? You wouldn't use too little, but I'd take him out and smack him because he's not behaving in church. And I'd come back in and you'd actually feel really rotten. Okay, because you know he's actually got a smack. It was back in those days, by the way. Uh, he got a smack for your bad behavior. But parents, we need to be very careful how we provoke our children. Uh, other people do it in church. Other people will do it to our children and we've got to discipline because if we've got rules in our family we've got rules in our family and you're, you're damaging the rules but we still have to abide by these rules but in the family unit it's very easy for us to stir our kids and then we deal with them because they didn't behave in the right way when we're the ones that pressed the button in the first place but we need to be very very careful of these things because we are responsible Parent, dads you're, you're responsible we're to, we are men to develop the nature of Christ. 
Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And listen to this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Not saying she's good for nothing, but she, she is, she's not as strong as we are, and I understand that. <clears throat> as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The way you treat your wife, God is watching. And you may think, oh, it's in the home. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Men, the way you treat your wives, God is knowing it. And if you think that you have the right to come to God and say, God, I need this. God, respond to me here. God, answer my prayers. If you're not treating your wives right, don't expect to hear from, from God. Because this scripture is telling us, you, you, you treat your partner wrong, God's not going to listen to you. And we, it's almost like we think we are beyond that. We're immune to that. But we need to understand this. We're talking about the Christian family. And we need to be very careful how we are treating husbands, especially wives. You've got to be careful as well. God won't hear you either. The woman is a help me. Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. You don't want to hear those words, but it's, that's what it's saying. It's actually talking about the authority in the home. Hopefully, we'll get to the stage of talking about ruling over, by the way. So, the woman, it's her responsibility to be a faithful helpmeet under subjection to her God-fearing husband. Uh, and even if your husband is not God-fearing, you still need to come under subjection to him, which is not easy. Let me just say, at the same time, nobody... God does not expect any, any wife to live in an abusive relationship, nor any husband to live in an abusive relationship. And there's more than, than brutality, physical brutality. There is, uh, there is uh, 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 men mental, emotional uh, abuse that can go on as well. And so we, we're, we're part of the church. In God's economy, he does not expect Lolita be, to be abused emotionally or anything by her husband. And if you think that I'm the head of this house, I can do what I want, I can say what I want, I can, but you cannot do it. And so uh, she does not, Lolita, you do not have to live in an abusive relationship because that is not the Christian family unit. Uh, you, you can scrub it off the tape afterwards if you want to, Daniel. I'm not sure if it's violating UPC bylaws or anything, but I do not believe anyone has to live in an abusive relationship. Children don't have to live in an abusive relationship. In fact, in the, you understand this day and age, if there's children being abused emotionally, physically, whatever, and we're suspicious of it, we have an obligation to report it to the police. Not just the minister. Every adult in this room has a responsibility, according to Victorian law, that if you think a child is being abused, you have, the, you have a legal responsibility to report it to the police. So, there, we, you, just because we're Christian does not we mean we, we, husbands, we can abuse our wives. There's nothing, there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that. Proverbs 31, verses <clears throat> 10 and 12. Pro, Proverbs 31 is about a good wife, by the way. But we don't have re, time to read it all. Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 12. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's fantastic. And let me tell you, there's some wonderful wives in this church that are just like this one that's described here. A, a, a wife comes under subject, subject, submission to her husband. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So we expect our wives to be under subjection to the husbands. 
in the church. Now, I've told you before, <clears throat> I don't know how long I've, since I've told you, but Ellen is under subjection to me. And that's a choice she makes. I cannot, there's, I cannot do anything in this world to bring under Ellen under subjection to my authority. I have no power whatsoever. I can beat her, but that doesn't mean she's under subjection. She may do as I'm saying, but she's not under subjection. Subjection is something you give so that when a wife is under subjection to her husband, she is giving, she is giving him the right to be the decision maker in that family. She's coming under subjection to her husband as the head of the home. And if she'll do that, then it'll run, run well. And even if the husband is not serving God, her subjection to him is, has a great likelihood of bringing him to the Lord because of her just willingness to listen and, and not, not be offensive to him. And, and uh, he, he, when he's making decisions that are not against her Christian principles, She's under subjection to him. So subjection is something that Ellen gives to me. It's not something that I can take from her or from anybody. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's a choice of a woman to come under subjection to anybody. Uh, Ephesians 5.33 tells us, uh, and the wife see that she reverence her husband, showing honor to her husband. Now the, the thing is, <coughs> I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a disaster when it comes to being a husband and a dad. I'm not really very good at it. But you get with Ellen and just try and get a few things out of her about how bad I am. Now, I don't know whether you've talked to her lately, but I don't think you'll get one word of badness about me from her. She, she may tell you he's a darling. He's so sweet. You know, she might not get down to the nitty gritty, but she just tells you things like that. But she will not criticize me because she just, she's, what she's doing, she's honoring me. She knows warts and all about me. And, and, and yet she still speaks kindly to me. She speaks when she's with others. You think that I'm a gem. But that's just her reverencing her husband. It's, it's something she does. She doesn't feel intimidated. She's just happy to do it. And that's what God is looking for. <clears throat> and uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2 talks about uh, if you behave that way, you may even win your lost uh, husband at the same time. Now, children are a precious offspring of the relationship. And it's a child's responsibility to obey his or her parents. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So children, yeah, not too many here, so I'll pick. Ha! Madison? Boys? Be under subjection. Obey your parents. It's a good thing to do. You need to honour your parents. Deuteronomy 5.16 Honour thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Proverbs 1 and 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 13 and 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So we, we would say to you, be careful how you... Uh, uh, discipline your children in this day and age again. But the, the, the Bible's not talking about belting your kids. But correction, it, there's nothing wrong with correction. According to, the, to God, there's nothing wrong with correction for your child. And, and um, I think that this, this generation now that's raising children has quite a challenge to, to discipline their children in a way that's pleasing to God, but also acceptable to the community. <clears throat> I, I, I was raised... Um, my children were probably the last generation that knew how, how dad could smack. But I don't know whether they can remember. He can, he can still remember. Okay. 
but correction, it's called correction. And if, uh, I've, in those days, if you smack somebody, um, they'd remember it and they probably wouldn't do it again. Proverbs 10 and 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son, this is what he says, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So you, you, you do as your parents ask, they will be proud of you. But you, you be disrespectful, disobedient, you're an embarrassment. That's what it's saying. Proverbs 22 and 6 tells us, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not be, depart from it. And that simply doesn't mean if, if we raise our children in the ways of God, they are obligated to walk in the ways of God. But I don't believe that if we raise our children in the ways of the Lord, when they're 50, they may not be living for God, but they cannot get away from the teachings of old. They cannot, they actually can't escape the, the scriptures that, they, that you put in them as kids, they can't escape them. And, and uh, that, that, so I know a guy, he was in his 50s, uh, and he came to church and he could quote a scripture. The, the pastor and somebody else were trying to figure out, what's that scripture? And he told them the scripture, not living for God or anything. But it's in there. They can't, it, they can't get away from it. It's in there. <clears throat> they have their lifetime to make a godly choice and repent. So, family relationships. Relationships are important for us as Christians. Uh, we need to have good relationships with the Lord and those around about us. And we might talk about relationships more uh, in, next week or so. But um, our relationship with Jesus affects the way we, we relate to other people. The way we relate to other people affects the way we, our relationship with the Lord as well. So, I want to talk about the relationship of husbands and wives. I'll talk about men and women, the husband and the wife, but I want to talk about th this in context of relationship. And as I said before, the best marriage relationships incorporate Jesus in them. You know, if, you don't, if Jesus isn't the head of your house, you're off to a bad start. And when we talk about women being under subjection to, to, to their husbands, in uh, Ephesians 5.23, Ephesians 5 and 21 tells us, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So when we quote, when we quote Ephesians 5.23, which I quoted earlier, wives be under subjection to your husbands, two verses before, it tells us be under subjection one to another. And so when we're talking about husbands and wives, we skip this verse and we go to verse 23, because especially for us men, it's good. Yeah. Wives be under subjection to your husbands. But this scripture is telling us to be subjection to one another. So, Daniel, you, you, you need to come under subjection to your wife. As You know, as this is not a battle. We want the best for the other person. And it's not... A, marriage relationship is not a battleground. It's somewhere where we're trying to, we, we are trying to get the best for both of us in the presence of God. And, and let me just tell... tell I'm getting... It, husband and wife, we're working together. Compromise is not the solution. <clears throat> because when Daniel says, I'm glad you're on the front row, when Daniel says to Lolita, we're going to do it this way, and she, said, and she says, I'd prefer not to. And she, he says, we're going to do it this way or we don't do it at all. And she says, okay. That's called compromise. And that doesn't do anything for that relationship. It just means that he gets his way all the time. So when we, we you might be told, you, you've got to find compromise. The compromise is not the solution in this thing. It's, it's wanting the best for the other party. And if we want the best for the other party, we're watching, if, Daniel, if you really love her, you want the best for her. And if she's coming under subjection and honouring him, she'll want the best for him. So we're looking for the best solutions. We're trying to get this thing to work nicely, not, not to be combative at all. So, submission to authority represents a source of strength and protection that flows out, out of a uh, mutual love. Now, I was very tempted to get a whiteboard and draw it here, but <clears throat> there, there is, a, I've got, I do have an overhead that shows an umbrella and a family under an umbrella. And really, 
If we, if we'll do this God's way, the whole family will be under the umbrella. But if the husband steps out, this is not going to work right. And if the wife steps out, it's not going to work. If the children step out, it's not going to work right. But we need the covering of Jesus Christ over everything we do in the family. And so we need to have an umbrella and we stay under the umbrella of the covering of God. And submission to authority represents a source of strength and protection that flows out of a mutual love. And when a husband exercises authority within the family, he needs to do it so that uh, do it out of a heart of love for his family and in the fear of God. So when he's when he's making a decision uh, that affects the family or his wife, he needs to do it out of love and with a with a fear of God in him that he'll make godly choices, good choices, because the choices he's making is trying to cover his family and protect his family. It's not because I just wanted a new car. And the husband bears a great responsibility to his family and he will give an account to the Lord for the spiritual leadership he provides or fails to provide. So men, if you're not doing, if you're not taking the authority authority that you have been given by God seriously, you are going to be answerable for, to God for the way that you behaved in this relationship. <clears throat> and what, when a woman submits to her husband, she is submitting to Christ, who is the primary partner in this relationship. So if Daniel thinks that Lolita, she's so submissive, he needs to be aware that she is submitted to Christ and he's getting the bonus of that. Does that make sense? So it's submission to Christ that makes it easy for her to come under submission to her husband. And so it's, not, it's not, no good thing in you. I think I might have told you that sometime, did I? <laughs> but it's not you. She's coming under submission because she's under submission to God. And as I said before, male headship does not give a husband the right to bully or abuse his wife. It's not talking about that at all. And we shouldn't view the divine order of authority as a suggestion that the Lord considers the man to be more intelligent than the woman or that the man is a wiser in, in making decisions. There's nothing to do with that. Marriage is a partnership. And uh, so when we've got a decision to make, uh, Alan and I will bounce things off of each other and uh, we'll try and come up with the best solution. <clears throat> but when a decision has to be made and we, 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 we're not sure, but a decision has to be made, we don't just decide, well, we'll skip that decision. Somebody has to take responsibility. Now we talk about it together and we come up with a solution and we make a decision and then find out that was the poorer choice of the two. Somebody has to take responsibility. And the men, you need to put up your hand and say, it's my responsibility. Because a family is not a two-headed being. It's a, it's, a, it's a system that's been created by God and somebody has to take responsibility. So it's not a question of how great idea, what great ideas we come up with, but who's responsible for the, for the circumstances of the family? Somebody has to take responsibility. And if, if Ellen says, I'll take responsibility, our family is not functioning. It's dysfunctional because I've got to put up my hand and say, it's my responsibility. I'll take responsibility for this. And so, uh, therefore, <clears throat> if, if, uh, if the outflow of finances is greater than income, I'm responsible. Whether she's, you know, the better bookkeeper, I'm responsible. Somebody is responsible for the decisions of the household. And when it comes down to it, uh, if we're in the courtroom of heaven, uh, on trial for our family relationships, God will want to know, Philip, your, your responsibilities. You're the one that's responsible. Why did you let this happen? It's as simple as that. It's not, it's not, not a power thing. It's just somebody has to take responsibility and God has said, it's the man that's going to have to take the responsibility. <clears throat> and so husbands should 
take their responsibilities that are given to them by God with humility and understanding their fallibility. Okay? We make decisions, but we are not perfect. I can think that lemon, it was a yet white Ford, but it was a lemon. Uh, that was my fault. And you haven't ever heard Ellen stand up when, when I've said that and say, no, no, it was actually my fault. It was my fault. I've got to take responsibility for it. And we sometimes make bad decisions, and that's just who we are. And we, we need to understand storms will come. But if we'll, if we'll put things in the hand of God, he'll work these things out. But let me tell you this, Ecclesiastes 4 and 12. Uh, this, I think, is, this, I think this is just talking about marriage. <clears throat> we can relate it to marriage. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so if we're in this love triangle, Jesus, husband and wife, it's a very strong cord. And we can go through some very difficult things. And there's plenty of families in here. We've been through some difficult things. But that threefold cord is not easily broken. And we can overcome a lot of things by, by a husband and wife that are living for God and he is that. He has the headship of the home. And when trials come, we actually know we can call on the Lord and God will respond. And he may take us through some pretty devastating things, but but this thing's strong and it will last forever. Okay, I I, I just want to, I've mentioned it before, but love is an important aspect of, of <clears throat> relationships. And, uh, and I, I, when I'm doing pre-marriage counselling, uh, I, I talk to them about the love bank. And I'm not necessarily an expert on it. But let me just say that um, I'm going to pick James because he won't know what to do. But <laughs> James comes into the church he doesn't know anybody. He comes into the church and people treat him nicely. And so when, when people treat him nicely, uh, he thinks, you, you know, they're nice people. And, and I, I think I'll come back to the church because they, they seem to be nice people. He might be seeking God, but he just, he likes being around the people. Well, what happens is the way that we behave toward him, we put deposits into his heart. And uh, so we treat him nicely, and, uh, and we put a deposit. He doesn't realize it, but we're putting a deposit into him. And I don't realize that I'm putting a deposit into him. So uh, people, people treat him nicely. So Daniel and Lolita were particularly nice to him. And so they put in deposits into him. And, uh, and, and he comes on Sunday, and I shake his hand and say, James, good to see you. Or I might say, uh, uh, David, good to see you. And and uh, and, uh, and and he, 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 they love him, but when I when I do that and I call him David, uh, it's Louise, I did it to you this morning, right? And and when when it's old age, but it doesn't matter. But when when that happens, I've just taken a deposit out of the love bank. Call him David instead of James, and so what what happened? <clears throat> Nobody noticed. I didn't even realise. I just call him Dave. You know, I do it every week. Every time I do that, I'm taking a deposit out. So if I'm not putting in deposits, I'm taking a deposit out. And it gets to a point where if I've withdrawn, I'm in debit in his bank account, he actually doesn't like me very much. So he likes most of the people in the church, but he doesn't like me that much because I've done withdrawals. Okay? He's got no control over it. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I need to be putting deposits in there. Now, if I'm putting in, if I'm taking more than I'm giving, he, he doesn't like me. But if I'm putting something in, he likes me. Now, what happens? I'll go over here. <clears throat> so what happens is this is going on with everybody. You're all involved with this and you've got no control. Of, well, you do have control over what you're putting in, but the people you're dealing with have no control over what goes in and what comes out. You're, you're the one that's dictating. So what happens is uh, Daniel and Lolita, 
they, they, they are in a church and everyone's putting deposits in, no one's taking deposits out and everything's growing. Uh, and, and Ellen and I, we're scratching our head and thinking, why don't those two get married? Well, the fact is somehow or other, they're not putting the deposits in that they, they could do better at it. And so they see themselves as best friends, okay, best friends. But not, there's nothing romantic about it because there's a level in Lolita's heart and there's a level in Daniel's heart and you've got to get above that level to be in love. And so <clears throat> they put on deposits and they were very, very slow at it. <laughs> Took them years, but eventually, ting, 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 and they're, they're above the level. And so all of a sudden, they're, ah, <laughs> because the bank has reached its love level, level. Now you laugh, but this is what happens. Now, if they've got any sense, they'll continue to put money into the bank, love into the bank. Now, I, I knew a man that used to buy flowers for his wife every Friday. Cha-ching, cha-ching. How many flowers have I bought Ellen? <laughs> right? So this, this man passed away and his wife was devastated because she loved him. She, she was madly in love with him. And he passed away and she, she didn't know what to do because her love bank was full of all the things that had been put in there by him. But the problem is if they're not still, they're married, they've been married for 25 years and, and uh, if they're not still putting deposits in, they are taking withdrawals. And you keep on taking withdrawals and the love bank starts to drop down. And so Ellen just the other day, she she said to me, you've got a bad habit, Philip. And I thought, what? And she said, and you better cut it out or else. So now I've, I'm near enough to 70 and I've got this new exercise I have to do to try and cut this out so I can put some more bank, love bank in the bank, right? And so every time I do this irritating thing to Ellen, I'm withdrawing funds out of my love bank. <clears throat> Got no control. I need to control this thing that she doesn't like. Because if I don't, every time I do it, I'm taking money out. Now what happens is that he's taking, they're taking, he's taking money out of the bank. And so he gets down below the love bank level, love level, and he's a like level. And so he's now in very dangerous waters. And the only one that can fix it is him putting more love into her. Do you understand what I'm saying? <coughs> and when it comes to relationships, if, if, um, if he's not putting things in but he's taking them out and then somebody else comes along, uh, it could be at work, but comes along to Lolita and he's nice to Lolita, uh, he's putting deposits in. And if he, put, if he does enough nice things, he's bringing his balance up. He's not doing withdrawals. He's just putting the balance up. And he goes up into the love category and he's dropped down into the like category or getting down to the, he's just ordinary, or he's taken them all out and she doesn't like him anymore. This other one's hit the love bank and he's putting deposits in. There's a danger in those relationships. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So we, as the church, I think that it's something that God has put into us. We don't control the love bank, but we control what goes in to other people. And in our families, husbands and wives, we need to work on our relationship. It's not, we've been married, it seems like about 65 years, I reckon. 40 what? And if I don't keep working at this, it's not going to survive. I still, if I'm 90, poor old brother Holden, he's 90, he's probably been married about 110 years, but he's still got to be putting stuff in. Do you understand? And so if you take this, this relationship that God has given you, if you don't take it seriously and you don't work on showing love to your partner, there's other people that are putting deposits in that you have no control over. And that's where marriages get into difficulty. So you need to make sure that both of, the leader, you need to make sure that you're putting more 
love deposits into him than anyone else. He needs to be the most important thing. And Daniel, she needs to be the most important thing. All of us, husbands, wives, you need to be working on the relationship. And just because when I remember when I remember when we got married, that's no, that's no help to maintaining this relationship today. And God wants us to maintain good marriages. And if we maintain good marriages, our children will like, like the family they're in. And we'll be able to raise good children as well. We'll have a good family relationship and we'll stay under the umbrella of the covering of Jesus Christ. Now I'll go off my notes a bit. I did stay with them most of the way. I skipped about five pages, I think. But I do want you to understand, in the church, our family relationships are very, very important. And you need to put your effort into it. These family relationships are very important. Important to God, important to you, important to your children. And so you need to put everything you can into these relationships. Let's stand.